Game loaded. Hi, and welcome to an edition of Lessons Learned with your host, Rafael Pinero. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Kevin Maloney, um, lead designer of the Shadowrun series of games that started with Shadowrun Returns and concluded with Shadowrun Hong Kong. Shadowrun started as a tabletop RPG in 1989 by FASA and has had many editions over the years from 1989 to today. Catalyst Games is now uh, running the fifth edition of the tabletop RPG, but it also had multiple incarnations in video games, such as the games for the CD Mega Drive, that was a Japanese version of the game, and Super NES, and also a uh, Sega Genesis versions, and Xbox version as well. And it has returned in the last year, in the last couple of years, starting with 2013, Shadow Returns. So now we're going to be talking to uh, Kevin Maloney about aspects of the design of the games and other questions that may come up in the next 30 to 50 minutes. Uh, Kevin? Hi, to yeah, thank you. yeah, thank you very much. Um, just one thing real quick off the top is uh, I was a designer on all of our five releases that we had, but I was only a lead designer on the, Hot the Hong Kong expansion. So in terms of uh, who was leading design throughout the different products, it changed as we as we moved through. But yeah, I was there for all of it and then uh, was the lead designer on the Hong Kong expansion. So yeah, I'm happy to be here and uh, looking forward to trying to remember all of the details of the crazy trip that making the Shadowrun games has been. Well, let's start with the fact that this was a, and still is, a paper and pencil uh, RPG, first and foremost. But when you try to translate a game like that to a computer, uh, the easiest seemingly way to do it would be to turn the computer into a GM, right? It runs all the numbers, it does all the dice rolls, et cetera, et cetera. But when you start playing Shadow and Returns, you don't see a lot of the mechanics you would expect from the tabletop RPG. Why did we have these significant changes from the table up ye to the computer game? Well, the development for the original rules did start in a very tabletop way. That was uh, mostly Mike Mulvihill, who was the line producer for Shadowrun 3rd Edition with FASA and uh, Trevor. Uh, King Yost, and then uh, you know Mitch and Jordan. Everybody was involved in that, and it started out as a very one-to-one -one kind of like let's. That was where it starts. Like okay, let's take the Shadowrun rules. We want to remain true to that, and then let's try to make a game out of it. But um, you know, video games are not board games. So as we moved along, uh, you know, some of those things we wanted to show people the guts of how stuff worked, and in other cases, we'll, you know, the idea was. To to get you into the action quickly because the audience for it was of course for Shadowrun fans and our backers but also just for people that might not be familiar with it so we sort of had to split the difference and make things approachable while retaining the spirit of Shadowrun. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about the spirit of Shadowrun because the game you talk about the third edition it has gone through many editions and, and well over two decades now how do you capture sort of that spirit, especially sort of retro spirit that is involved in the cyberpunk aspect of Shadowrun, but at the same time keep it current enough that modern players can sort of recognize and, and play it and don't feel like they're being anachronistic as they play the game? Um, well, there's sort of two lines on that. There's sort of like the systems and the mechanics, and then there's like the spirit of Shadowrun cyberpunk. So... Yeah, which one of those two do you want to check out? Do you want to talk about mechanics, like, you know, nuts and bolts game design-y kind of stuff? Or do you want to talk about, like, the spirit of how do we make this feel like a Shadowrun experience? Because those are sort of two different parts. Well, let's start with the spirit of it. Like, for example, the art, the music, sure. uh, the yeah. writing. So yeah. It gives you that feeling of, oh, this looks familiar enough that it's cyberpunk and, and Shadowrun, yeah. but at the same yeah. time it has to look fresh as well. Yeah, there's a thing in the Shadowrun community that, we talk about that wasn't invented by us. It's just part of the world of Shadowrun, and it's called like pink mohawk and black trench coat. And it's kind of like a thing that's sort of like a spectrum of the world of Shadowrun and, and cyberpunk too. And like the black trench coat side of things is like you know the very like special ops, like you know cloak and dagger, espionage kind of thing. 
And Pink Mohawk is just like the really crazy plan where I can't believe we did something so crazy and that actually worked. So you really got to, it's really blending those sort of two, two worlds together. And that's what really, for us, Shadowrun's all about. You know, it's the, it's the you know, corporate high-tech espionage stuff and also stuff where it's just like really kind of crazy stuff can happen sometimes. And that was really what we, you know, took away from what Shadowrun was and is and, uh, you know, eff- made the best efforts we could to put that into all the games we made. So essentially you... You take the player and say, you know, you're in a dark conspiracy, but you're also facing these incredible odds. So you have to pull off, you know, incredible feats in order to succeed. And that gives you the, the mix between the, the pink mohawk and the uh, dark overcut. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, that's it more or less. And then the other thing that was really valuable for us was all of us. Had all had played lots and lots and lots of the tabletop. Like for me, like I started in the early '90s with third edition, so it was pretty intense to be working with with Mike Mulvihill, who was the the line producer on those books at FASA. And um, you know, we just took sort of all the best sort of tone notes from our tabletop experiences over the years and brought them into the game as best we could. And, uh, yeah, we managed to find a lot of success with that. And that, that was really fun, and that also made it really personal in terms of the content we made. And, I don't know, that charm really came out the other side, just how much heart we have for the IP. Uh, people seem to really pick up on that in a positive way, so that was really rewarding. Now we go into a little bit of the mechanics. Uh, for example, Karma is a, a very important mechanic on both the tabletop and the video game. However, in the video game, it's only limited to character progression. Um, why was that? Why was that limit? Why do we have, for example, a mechanic that we can sort of alter things on the fly, the way that it can be used in the tabletop? Oh, um, well, two reasons, really, in terms of like when that's when those systems were originally laid down. One, in terms of like the way you're talking about how you know karma can be used to save you for from critical hits and for incredible feats, like in the tabletop, right? Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, trying to figure out what that sort of general context would be in, like, a video game system is really tough. And then the main reason is that we needed we need to be able to know at any given point about what your possible progression could be and how strong your character is at a given point in the game. So if that's highly variable and we still want you to have a good experience, we sort of had to keep things limited to progression in that respect. So, um, but, you know, in terms of, like, things sort of being really open-ended, it took a It wasn't really until we got to the Hong Kong expansion that we were able to sort of support a mechanic like that and understand how that could work. And we did that. If you choose to... uh, Let's see if I can figure this out without spoilers. Um... Mm -hmm. If you choose to sort of make a bad decision at the end of Shadowrun Hong Kong, uh, that has some interesting results in uh, the expansion. So once we got to sort of the end of the way, end of things, we figured out ways to sort of do a more generalized role-playing system like that. So that is the best way I can describe that we kind of figured out after a long time how we could do something like that, the way Karma was originally used, but it took us all the way to the end of Hong Kong before we could figure it out. So yeah, that's the, that is the long story long in terms of that. Yeah. For example, I see a starting with, uh, I do believe starting with the second game with Dragonfall, you have in fact a leveling system for NPCs. Like the first time I experienced it, I was like, what a yeah. and I found that very interesting because again, in the tabletop, there's, it's a completely different system. It's a skill based system. And you retain that for, uh, for the players throughout the game, for the player character. What led you to introduce that for NPCs? Um, well, we wanted to, you know, everyone, like, wants to have more control over, like, your your crew members, right? Like, that's like that's common to all sorts of video games. You want to control the progression. But the thing was, is that our character, we actually added that in the Director's Cut expansion for Dragonfall. It wasn't in the original version, Mm-hmm. And it's something we always talked about, but we're like, okay, at that point, like, we know who Glory is. Like, she, she's, a, she's, you know, a street samurai, and we know who Iger is, and she's a sniper, and we know who Dietrich is. He's a shaman, and, like, 
you know, Blitz is a rigger and a decker and, you know, has a few lessons to learn about life. But um, we didn't want to, the crew was designed in such a way to fulfill specific roles in the team and also have specific personalities. So it's like, yeah, we wanted you to control their progression because that's interesting and give them cool abilities that are interesting, but still make sure that they are them and they can't. So that's why we didn't let you spec them any way you wanted. Here's another thing I noticed as the games progressed. The first game, you had allies, but you doing, didn't really have a, a, a team assembled. You were basically a lone character that could have some allies, and you had to, well, if you really wanted a rounded team for all situations, you had to spend money to fill in those spots. But by the second and third games, you, you can still hire people, of course, but you have a, a central team. What led to that change? Well, in terms of just the, the money part of things, um, we, when we created, like up until, you know, Director's Cut came out and, and Dragonfall, we're like, okay, like for the first one, we're like, you hire runners, runners cost money, that makes sense. But then we really had to tie, your, tie ourselves in knots where it was just like, okay, we know for this mission, you're going to need a Decker. And it's like, well, what if you don't have money? Like, ah, you know, and we just want, we're like, okay. There should be a crew, a crew of shadow runners with you that don't cost any money, so we don't have to worry about a situation where I bought too many med kits, so now I can't hire the person that I need because that's just you know that's that's a tough problem. And then also in terms of making adding a consistent crew, it was something that we wanted and like we thought was great, but like you know the development of Shadowrun Returns was you know ultimately we were happy with how things came out our backers were really happy it did pretty well but like it was a tough development so it was just like just getting our story around the central character straight in shadow run returns was a really challenging task and we didn't really have the ability to add more characters and then when we did dragonfall we're like you know what we're gonna do this time we're gonna we're gonna hire a writer and that's when we brought andrew mcintosh on board and he really really went with it um and you know really brought all those characters to life with input from everyone else of course but yeah that was that was how we sort of got from a to b from not really having a crew to having one so it, all these things point to basically uh not simply different iterations of the same product but in fact the evolution of of the systems and the team itself and you brought someone in etc which is i think a lot of people either think of video games as sort of being more of the same in the same IP or being wild revolutions between different IP. But in your in the case of Shadowrun, it seems that it is more of, you know, these are the lessons we learn from the first time we make the first game, we apply those lessons and on and on and on. For example, with the Matrix t style game in the third game in Hong Kong, it's very different or it feels significantly different from the, the way it was done in the other two games. Why, for example, add that sort of semi-stealth uh, mechanic to it? Yeah, um, yeah, that was um, the development of the Matrix stuff for Hong Kong was stuff that I had that I headed up. And the Matrix is like always been like super required. Like you can't have Shadowrun and not have the Matrix. Like that's that's you know you got to do it. And then also, it's a, a hard nut to crack from a development standpoint because you don't have the scope to make two whole video games. You have the scope to make one video game. So in terms of the changes specifically, you mentioned like the stealth stuff was because, and we, someone made a comment on one of the steam forums about the matrix and it really stuck with us. It was snarky, but it were like, okay, I can kind of see that a bit. And the, the quote was, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, was like, you know, the Matrix doesn't really feel like I'm hacking a system. It feels like I'm fighting ghosts in an empty disco. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which, uh, it's just like, ooh, that burns a little. But I, I, I kind of see your point. Not the most constructive way of offering the feedback, but I get it. So we get it. So that was like, we wanted to make it feel like you were infiltrating a system. So that was why we added that particular element. As well as the code breaking and the mm -hmm. other thing. So it's just yeah. simply a matter of fighting yeah. in a sense that it, uh, to me, if I were to offer my piece of criticism as well as benefit as well, would yeah. be that uh, it feels very much like the quote unquote real life uh, mechanics in the game. 
Yeah. Uh, so it was simplified in a sense that you have the same feeling that you were seeing similar powers and abilities, but I can also see that the sense of, well, I'm doing this in more, like, uh, more or less in a white space, in a white room. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the graphics and, and the addition of the other aspects of the third game really make it feel like it's a unique space. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was one thing, too. The, uh, the art team was able to go, like, rethink how the Matrix looked in a lot of significant ways. And they did some great stuff. I've, I'm still particularly blown away, um, just to get really nerdy here, um, the sculpted system uh, in Prosperity Tower in Hong Kong uh, the art team crushed it there. Like that is some that is some really good, cool cool looking stuff. Talking about art, uh, one of the interesting things about this game is that it has, of course, it has fantasy elements for, uh, because of the fantasy side, urban fantasy, sci uh, sci fi fantasy side of Sh- of Shadowrun. You have elves and dwarves and trolls and orcs, but it also has a significant diversity of characters, ethnicity, religion. Uh, body shapes and even gender or not perhaps that part wasn't as extent extensive as perhaps other areas but also has gender and sexuality was that simply a, a reflection of the base game or was it that a goal of the teams like we want a more diverse game as we uh, go forward i wouldn't say it was like a goal but we think like as a studio that Everyone who is like in the world <laughs> should be represented in our products. And by that, we mean that they are present. Like we don't try to speak for uh, any particular group. We just present these people as characters or in the world as they are in real life. Um, and, you know, speaking, you know, briefly, you know, about getting too political, uh, for us and for me, you know, I think that's the right approach is just like, these are just people like these people, like people are people and that's the end of it. And I think we did a really, we did a really great job of being inclusive and being diverse. And I'm really proud of that as a studio and I'm happy to work there, work here. And I think we handled it. We handled everything correctly. And yeah, that's just the long and short of that. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Very much. Yeah. Uh, Also, you have a situation where you start in Seattle. You then go to uh, the F state in, in Berlin, and then finally you, you're in Hong Kong. And that, I think to me they're very interesting because, again, going back to the source material, uh, a lot of the focus is on Seattle, but then you chose to sort of give us a, a sort of a, a world tour, showing us other places, other environments. Uh, what led to that? What led to say, okay, fine, Seattle was one thing, but we need to go to Hong Kong, we need to go to Germany, we go to other places. What, so what was the impulse behind that? Uh, that actually came from the backers during the first Kickstarter. We did a poll of where the city should be set and more or less just kind of went down the list. Uh, we committed to doing Seattle and Berlin in the first Kickstarter, and then Hong Kong was the next on the list. And, uh, yeah, it's just like there's reasons because there's reason Shadowrun fans like those cities because of the lore and material built up around them. And, you know, they're good reasons, which was why we were able to make interesting, like really play off those settings when we made those games, because, yeah, those are interesting places in the Shadowrun universe. We were able to flesh out and add some stuff of our own. And, um, yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. Catalyst actually made a book, a source book for Hong Kong that uh, overlaps and provides some detail from the stuff we did in Hong Kong. So we're actually able to add some stuff in that respect. But, yeah, that's why we went to those cities. Did it take a lot of research uh, to go to these other places, especially Hong Kong, which is, I suppose, uh, very distinct to many many yeah. Western settings? Yeah, one of the advantages of like Shadowrun being around for as long as it has been um, is that we were actually got we were able to be put in contact with uh, fans and other people that have worked on the game that live in those cities, so both through the development of Shadowrun Dragonfall, which, for, which was Berlin, and then Hong Kong, we actually have people that we would do a lot of, and yeah, we did lots of research, but then we're actually able to run these things by. It's like why our art in Hong Kong, like all of our signs actually make sense. And they're like, we've had a, we go through and we check all of that stuff. 
and that's just doing due diligence really like that's just like and it's also a really provides a lot of great prompts for the art and you know design and writing teams it's like okay well this is how the culture is there so this is how we would expect this environment to be and those are great prompts for all of us so it's just it's doing you know due diligence on your locations and it just provides so much you know great stuff to build content off of now a very uh, i suppose technical question very geeky question about mechanics and the construction of the games the games seem to have a a diamond shape uh quest uh structure yeah you, you start with a basic mission which is an introductory mission to the systems and characters then expands out into the hub area seattle the barons yeah have stayed in germany and the docks in hong kong mm -hmm. and then at the end of the, once you re, re, uh, gather your people your resources and all these yeah missions it sort of narrows down to the bottom of the diamond is that an accurate description or at least yeah. a, a understandable description of how the games were constructed yeah that's right um you know in video game parlance for a lot of rpgs and a lot of bioware games follow this model and other games follow this model it's like the act three gate like what do you have to do to get there and uh, yeah that's more or less how they're set up what is the strength of having this diamond shape or gate system for the the quest structure and the story structure as well as the mechanics what are some of the advantages well uh we didn't have that structure in shadowrun returns which is a little linear um but the idea is that it allows you to control what content you want to do when and it also allows us to allows you to feel like you're actually exploring the world of Shadowrun instead of like being force fed a series of events and um, you know it, through that and like a, some linear content we're able to provide a really good mix like for example um, there's the lights out mission in uh, Dragonfall and that'll always happen after like X number of missions so we're able to sort of like move the main line along in the background we're letting you pick and choose what you want to go do next so that's why we like it we think it's good for players to feel like they're running a shadow run crew like you're picking up jobs deciding where and when you want to go um yeah that makes you feel more like a shadow runner for sure than just like sort of being on this uh, more on rails experience so it's a way of strengthening the sense of player agency you got it that the player is in control yep. to a certain extent and it also it. tends to reinforce the illusion of control. You, yep, that's, yeah. Uh, but the thing about the diamond shape is I found in many other, in some other games is perhaps that at, when you go down to the final point, to the end of the game, uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like it fits what you've done up to that point, both mechanically as well as narratively. Uh, and I And this is more of a, you know, a way I like to think about this thing, perhaps it's not the way it's talked in the industry in general terms, but I like to think that it's a, maybe a problem of managing expectations, the so player's expectations. Like if you don't manage the expectations just right, then there, there's a disconnect between what the players think is going to happen versus what the game represents. Are there any tips or things that you do to manage those expectations? Or you simply say, this is the story we're going to present, this is the game we're going to present, and we hope that the players come along for the ride. A uh, little of column A, a little column B. Are you, like, you know, speaking specifically of the fact that, like, in terms of how much player agency is going to impact the end of the game, is that what the tension that you're talking about? It's related to that. I think it's related to the fact that uh, as a player uh, finishes quests, etc., or does certain, you know, mechanical decisions, that creates a certain, certain set of expectations. Like, oh, if I have this ability, then I'm probably going to use it again. If I talk to this character and they gave me this clue about what's going on, then that might lead me to think that this is what's really going to happen in the end. And uh, sometimes it feels like, oh, I believe in this, and the game, not that the game necessarily is going to disregard completely, but it went into something that doesn't seem to fit what was there before. Like, doesn't seem to be proper foreshadowing at times, mm -hmm. both mechanically yeah. as well as uh, narratively. Yeah, speaking like of the narrative stuff, we do, and we constantly talk about, um, you know, the idea of like narrative payoff, like setup and payoff. Like, there's stuff that we have we did not ship that is cool because we try to keep our spider senses that were active for things. It's just like, well, you know, we can't really make this quest reward 
we got this thing that can hack all the computers because that is not a thing that we pay off ever, so we should not ever give the player something that is contextualized like that. It's going to bite us later. So we're, all look, we're always looking out for that. Um, I'm pretty happy about how much agency we do put in there and in terms of like how many downstream effects there are. Um, we were really, really lucky in that the way things sort of worked out at the studio level and the way things worked out with Shadowrun that we were able to do the uh, director's cut version of Dragonfall because it actually was out in the wild for a little bit and we got to sort of tune into people's reactions. And when you're in the middle of development, sometimes, you know, see the forest from the trees is really tough, but after giving it a little time on the shelf and then getting a second swing at it, we were able to like add even more setups and payoffs and things can get pretty elaborate in terms of how Dragonfall can end. And we brought some of those lessons over into Hong Kong as well. So I think we did a pretty good job and then uh, like keeping downstream, exp like paying off downstream expectations that we set up. And the other thing too is we just try to be consistent with how we use agency across the game. So, you know, it doesn't seem like there's more to happen at the end. Like, I mean, I, like personally, I, as a Mass Effect fan, I was one of the folks that had a somewhat negative reaction to the end of Mass Effect 3 in terms of like expectations and payoff. So, you know, you know, that was my personal fan reaction to it. And so, you know, really making sure that you keep the level of payoff consistent all the way through the product is a really important thing. And I, yeah, I think we did a good job of that. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to mention Mass Effect because that's become one of the golden third rails of video game history. Yeah, but yeah, the point is tough. well taken. Yeah, but for the record, I played Mass Effect One and Mass Effect Two all the way front to back three times, and uh, I really love that series, and I'm really, really, really looking forward to Andromeda. I hope it, I hope it's awesome. It looks cool from what little I've seen of it so far. Uh, another aspect of this is also because uh, this is a role playing game, and the subjects you the team, not you only individually, but the team chose to tackle. Some of them are pretty heavy. I mean, they yes. go with the genre, of course. Yes. But still, it's something that many game design teams would shy away from. You talk about sometimes about sexual slavery in the first yep. game. Yep. Uh, there's discussions of Satanism and religion yep. in the second game, and even in the yep. third game as well. A, with, you know, why did you choose to tackle these issues? And the second question is, were there issues like, you know, this might be in the game or might be suggested by the source material, but we're not going to touch them because we're not going to go there. Um, you know, that's just a, basically, you know, that's just dealing well with mature content. And like, it is a mature game and Shadowrun is not the most pleasant of worlds. And in places, we wanted to bring that out just to show like how dark dark could get. But when you do that, it's very challenging because those are really, I don't know, it's kind of like using super spicy spices in your soup or whatever. Like you put too much in and it ruins it and you definitely don't want to use it for just the sake of using it. Like that's awful. Um, but, you know, showing some of the darker parts of life as reasons for intense character motivation, like myself, like one of the really darker, dark things that and I, that I worked on and all that, that's a lot of darks, um, was Glory's side mission. That was something that I got to work on and uh, was really wanted to work on. And me and Andrew worked really tightly on that. And it was really difficult. It was a very challenging piece of content to make. But we really to show the humanity of some awful stuff and really take you through those powerful journeys with characters. I mean, people love glory and that's because they've seen some of the worst parts of her life and come through, you know, hopefully on the good side of things with her. So that's really, it, the goal is to make meaningful experiences and sometimes that can go to some intense places. And as long as you approach that stuff, like in, like a mature creative adult, you can get some really good stuff out of it. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes, it does. And there's also an aspect of that, and also in the third game has several characters, which you sort of, as a player character, influence their decisions. Uh, I like the fact that, for example, if you choose to sort of 
I suppose, power game, if you will, like, oh, this seems like a great ability. You can do so, and the game deals with it in a narrative sense, but it doesn't necessarily penalize you, like, wax your finger and you and goes like, oh, you shouldn't have done that, right? It mm-hmm. says, well, these are the consequences for doing that without mm-hmm. sort of taking away the aspect of, of the ability or power or, mm-hmm. or the line. Um, now, uh, the sort of final question going to crowdfunding. Now, yeah. an aspect of the fact of successful crowdfunding is that what I would call the crowdfunding or Kickstarter uh, bloat. That is that as you have backers and you say, oh, you know, you, you, we raised $100,000 or a million dollars or $5 million, we are going to include this or that. How do you manage including features in, in the game, for example, without sort of becoming a sort of self-perpetuating cycle and that the more, yeah. uh, you know, features you add, the more yeah. money you need and, yeah. and, and on and on. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I wasn't the, on the front line of, you know, creating and managing those Kickstarters. I mean, I, with a lot with the rest of the team, was asked for input on various parts so we could do the best job we could. But, you know, HBS has done a lot of Kickstarters, and, like, the project I'm on now, Battletech, is yet another one. And if you look at, say, for the campaign for Hong Kong, there was a point where we just stopped, too, like, putting stretch goals. And people were like, oh, you should put, you know, some folks were commenting that you should put in more stretch goals. And we're like, no, like we know that this is, that would just sort of be adding scope for more like in the goal of getting more Kickstarter money. The, the goal always is with Kickstarter stuff around here, as far as I can tell, <laughs> as someone who's not in charge of those things, um, that we want to set things up to make the best game that we can. And if we have good ideas that we think we can execute on well and deliver, then we'll put those out and see if they get funded. But we're not going to just add features on willy-nilly for lots of money. And that helps. It helps that, like, you know, we got people like, you know, Mitch Gittleman and Jordan Wiseman, you know, that it's not their first barbecue when it comes to putting out video games. And they're able to come up with cool stuff and also manage, manage things well. And finally, we wrap up with uh, questions about the incoming or upcoming uh, products that might be down the line. Sure. Uh, anything you want to tell us about Battletech and any other other <laughs> projects that you're working on? Um, well, Necropolis is coming down the pipe really soon, and uh, I'm lucky enough that uh, we all have dev accounts, so I can just pick up at my desk, even though I'm on a different floor from the Necropolis team, and just uh, see what they're up to. Actually doing some playtesting this week. And uh, really, really, really excited. It's third-person action roguelike. The Necropolis recreates itself on every playthrough. It's got awesome co-op. Um, really looking forward to all that stuff. The art style is fantastic. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be coming out for uh, uh, PC and uh, console. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, as Susan hopefully reminded me, um, our publisher for that. Uh, for yeah, for the console version is uh, Namco Bandai. So we're really lucky to be work with them. They're helping us out with a lot of the console stuff, and that is very cool. And then, um, yeah, so the studio is just all eyes studio-wise are on Necropolis stuff right now. We're all very excited for that. And then, um, yeah, PC will be on Steam. And let's see, I think that's all the big details I really want to get out. Um, mm-hmm. And then... Battletech is still some time away, and we're working working hard on that. And, uh, yeah, uh, Battletech stuff, um, you know, best place to stay tuned for that is our Kickstarter updates and other stuff from our Twitter account as that's progressing. i got to put in a brief plug in, too, for our Twitch-affiliated uh, channel, Hyper Rabbit RPG. Um, I've been fortunate enough to get in on the Battletech show, Death From Above, that, that's on there. If you haven't checked that, that out on Twitch, it's really fun. Um, you'll see different HBSers on there as well as uh, people from different parts of the Twitch community on there all the time. And, uh, yeah, so Necropolis soon and uh, Battletech later and super encouraging stuff happening on both those. No, we'd like to thank uh, Kevin Maloney and uh, the team at Hairbrain uh, Games for um, Hairbrain Schemes <laughs> for this <laughs> wonderful interview. And as always, if you like this or any uh, video or 
podcasts on this channel, please comment and subscribe, and we will see you when we see you. Good night.